Good morning, Arise. I miss you guys so much. I can't wait to see you guys hopefully soon. Please join me in prayer at this time. Lord, thank you so much, Father, for this day. Thank you because you have given us everything that we need, Lord. You have provided for us, Lord. I want to pray and ask, Lord, for those family members that have lost a loved one, Lord, in these recent days, Father, through injustice. Father, I pray for each and every single person, Lord, that at this time may have lost their job, that at this time may have gotten sick with COVID-19. I pray for our healthcare providers, Lord, that you continue to give them endurance during this time. Father, I ask, Lord, that you be with our seniors, Lord, that as they start this new chapter in their lives, Father, that they continue to pursue you. Lord, please help us all continue to build on our faith. Help us to continue to share with others the great news. Lord, at this time, Father, I ask for a very special uh, prayer for our speaker today, Lord. Give him your Holy Spirit, Lord. And Father, continue to pursue us. Continue to allow us, Father, to come to you every single day. In these things I ask in Jesus' name, amen. I hope to see each and every one of you soon. I love you very much and have an amazing day. Hey guys, how you doing? Good afternoon. Uh, it's me, Ray. I'm live streaming from my house. I just want to let you guys know how much Life Group has been involved in my life. All I want to say is that Life Group has been a blessing to be part of it. I've learned so much about the Bible, even though I'm still a novice. I've learned so much about the Bible. I learned so much about my brothers and sisters, from Patrick to Janet to George and my surrounding cast. Life Group has been a great example to me in my life. Not only sharing every night when we go over there at 7.30 about the gospel and about Jesus Christ. My saying and my love to God is, is amazing. And I feel super, super well overwhelmed with every day that passes and I've been involved with my church, which I miss dearly. I miss my, I miss my church so much. I can't wait to go back to church and, and, and be with my surrounding friends and, and all of the above. But regarding the light proof, this has been a special blessing in my heart to me, my wife, my son, and my daughter. Life group has been not only a growing part of my life, but it's given me knowledge as, as I go through and as I grow in the gospel with Jesus Christ. So guys, I hope to see you soon. I hope that everybody's safe in their homes. And I hope that we can get through this pandemic as smooth as we can. And, and the best of luck to everybody. I love you guys and God bless. Hi, my name is Sofia Jimenez, and I just want to say I'm really thankful for a life group because it's just a safe space where I can open up about my life, whether it's good things or bad things that is happening in my life. I feel free to share it, and I know that I will be safe there. I also um, am very thankful for it because I get to learn about the stories in the Bible in a way that also reflects on my life and connects to my life in a way that I've never noticed before.
start before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light. And as you speak, created the 
light of the world, abandoned in darkness to die. Mm -hmm. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. Where you lost your life so I could find it here. If you left the grave behind you so alive, I can see your heart in everything you've done. Every part designed in a work of art called love. If you gladly chose surrender so will I I can see your heart in eight billion different ways every precious one a child you died to save if you gave your life to love them so alive like you would billion times but what measure could amount to your desire the one who never leaves the one behind Good morning, Arise Miami. Welcome back. So grateful you could join us. So grateful you're making the time to continue with us on our new sermon series of following Jesus into the pandemic. And here we are. We are following Jesus. Where? Into the pandemic. Now, that's kind of a strange title. That's kind of like a weird title for a sermon series. But but we want you to think. We want you to explore the idea that, that we are not alone, that we're not just aimlessly going in through difficulties and trials, but we can be confident that Jesus is at the head of our lives, at the head of our church, at the head of this of this planet, at the head of our nation. And so as we explore this, I, I want you to give us an opportunity to just kind of look at the word of God and see where we can find confidence uh, during these difficult and challenging times. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, this, this next sermon title. We've entitled it No Test no testimony. So I, I want you to think about what that means for us as we journey through this. If there's no test, there's no testimony. So file that away. And I want you to, you know, just kind of keep that in mind as we as we journey through this. And, and, and one of the questions that I've asked myself, you may be asking yourself the question as well, whose idea is this? Or better said, whose idea was this? I've heard that there's three types of people. There's a the type of person that makes things happen, and there's the type of person that watches things happen, and there's the type of person that asks, what happened? 
So I don't know which one of those you identify with. Are you the person that makes things happen? Are you the go-getter? Are you the one that's like out there, type A, I'm going to get this done, and, and, and you're type A, you make things happen? Or are you the one that just kind of sits back and you watch things happen? Like nobody's, nobody's fooling you. Nobody's pulling the wool over your eyes. You know exactly what's going on. You're kind of just chilling. You're watching things happen. Or are you the type of person that's like clueless? You don't know what's going on. You're like, what in the world just happened? So I don't know which one of those you connect with the most. But I want to tell you, none of us, and I mean none of us, could have imagined that we would be here, you know, before 2020 started. None of us. Where were you? Where were you? Uh, December 31st, 2019, I, I saw a meme and it made me think and it kind of, it's a little bit of humor. It was a little humorous, but I, I love seeing this meme. It said, and to think that we celebrated the beginning of this year. I mean, I was there. I was at a friend's house, family friend. I had a glass of Martinelli in one hand, you know, that, that non-alcoholic apple cider. I had like, I think I had some grapes. I'm not sure. Well, there's a tradition you got to eat 12 grapes. I don't know what that's about. 12 grapes, 12 months, something like that. And, and I was there with friends, with family. We were cheering. We were watching the ball drop coming down. You know, you know how it is. Times Square, you know, watching that ball drop. When the ball dropped, we cheered, we hugged, we kissed. We went outside, threw some fireworks, shot some fireworks up into the, into the sky. I mean, I, I, I just think about it. Where were you December 31st, 2019? We were celebrating this. Now, there's something sobering about that celebration, because two of the people that I celebrated with, two of them are no longer here. Two of them in the last several months passed away because of COVID. And I think about this because I'm certain that as we gather together with friends and family to celebrate the beginning of 2020, and they raise their glasses to do a toast for the new year, I'm certain neither of these two people, loved ones, knew that they were ushering in the final year of their life. Their families didn't imagine it. None of us did. And so here we are. But whose idea is this? Whose idea was this? And I want you to look at what the Bible says in Mark chapter 4, verse 35. And I want you to know that today we're going to look at Mark chapter 5. We're going to look at Mark chapter 5, verse 1 to 20. But before we look at Mark chapter 5, we got to look at Mark chapter 4, because without it, we're going to lack a very important context. And I want you to read it with me. Mark chapter 4, verse 35 says this. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Let me make it absolutely clear to you today. Jesus is speaking in Mark chapter 4. And it is his idea for the disciples to get into the boat and go to the other side. It's, it's absolutely crystal clear. He said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. So whose idea was it to get in the boat and to cross over? It was Jesus's idea. Now, Mark chapter 5 has an incredibly powerful story. It's an incredible story that we're about to get into in a little bit. But before we do that, you have to understand this story of Mark chapter 4. Jesus says, let's get in the boat. Let's go to the other side. Why? Why is that essential for you to understand? Because Mark chapter 4, when Jesus says, get into the boat, this is when the disciples cross over the lake with Jesus. And in the middle of the night, a storm overtakes them. This is the story. This is the story where Jesus is in the boat. The disciples are like straining at the oars. This storm comes out of nowhere. It threatens to sink the boat. And the disciples are like scrambling. I mean, these guys are strong men. These dudes are buff dudes. They're like bailing water. Like, like the ocean is getting into the boat. The ocean's supposed to stay outside the boat because if enough ocean gets in the boat, then the boat goes to the bottom of the ocean. You know how physics work. And, and these disciples are straining at the oars. They're bailing water. They're screaming. They're like screaming instructions. And, and all of a sudden, somebody sees Jesus, and Jesus is asleep. Who in the world can sleep while there's a storm raging around? And one of the disciples yells and says, Master, Jesus, don't you care that we're about to die? Now, this is essential for us to kind of key in on. The storm doesn't wake up Jesus. The rocking of the boat doesn't work, wake up Jesus. The, the uncomfortable ocean spray that's probably hitting him doesn't wake him up. You know what wakes Jesus up? The cry for help of one of his children. All of a sudden, Jesus opens his eyes and he's like, what are you guys worried about? And the Bible says that he rebukes 
the wind and the waves. He tells the waves, chill out, be quiet, be still. And instantly, instantly the sea is glass. It's as if nothing, it, it, it couldn't be more peaceful. And Jesus all of a sudden calms the storm. And there in Mark chapter four, he says something really dramatic. He says, why were you afraid? Have you no faith? Now, Jesus doesn't say, Do you have, don't you have enough faith? Are, are you lacking some faith? Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus says, have you no faith? Like you have zero faith. And the disciples are in awe. They're marveling at at Jesus's words, Jesus's power. They're in awe. And all of a sudden, as as they finish that chapter, this is when chapter five begins. You You got the context now? You have the kind of background to what's going on? You just came out of a storm. And all of a sudden, the Bible says that this happens. Look what it says there in the book of Mark, chapter 5, verse 1 to 22. The Bible says, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. Now, what, what, this, this passage here, this scripture doesn't really do it justice. The, the Bible here doesn't, doesn't really give us exactly a, a clue as to what's going on here tr- truly. Like, imagine somebody coming out of the tombs as soon as you land on the shore and some psychopath comes running at you. And it's, and it's a guy that's possessed by a demon. It's a, it's a guy that's not in his right mind. He's, he's, his, his, his mind has been taken over by the dark side. And, and he's foaming at the mouth. He's yelling. And everybody knows this dude is crazy. And as soon as they see, the disciples see. Now, this is just my imagination, my sanctified imagination. As soon as the disciples see this lunatic maniac running at them, I imagine that they turn around and they start running. And they're just booking it. And, and, and you know, John is probably the youngest. So he's probably the fastest. He's like, I'm out of here. I'm not sticking around for no demon-possessed dude. And he's running. And, the, and then Peter's probably behind. And, and James and Judas. And, and all of a sudden, somebody yells and says, Bro, we can't forget Jesus. And and where's Jesus? And they turn around and guess what? Jesus is not running. Jesus is not running at all. Jesus is back where they left him because Jesus is not afraid. He's not afraid of any challenge that that they face, that he faces. And and the disciples kind of turn around and they come, start walking back towards Jesus and and Jesus is there. Now, now get this. Have you felt like you just came through one crisis and all of a sudden you're facing another? Don't miss the context of Matthew chapter four, moving into chapter five, because you just got done with a crisis And now you just get to your destination and are faced with another crisis. You know, this guy, this demon-possessed guy is is something to behold. The Bible says about this guy, look what it says there in in verse 3. It says that uh, when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. Verse 3 says, this man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, even with a chain. This guy lives in the cemetery. Have you, have you been to a cemetery? They're peaceful places, but they're not places like any of us hang out. Like if, if people are walking by, some people are still superstitious and they walk by, you know, the graveyard and they're like, oh my goodness, don't go into the cemetery at night. It's kind of spooky. There might be ghosts there. Now we know that there's no ghosts, but it's still, some people have that superstition and it's creepy. This dude lives there. This guy lives in this place, in the tombs. He's surrounded by all of these, these catacombs and, and they tried, the townspeople tried to bind him up. They tried to chain him up. They, but, but the Bible says that they couldn't chain this guy up for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and he broke the irons on his feet and no one was strong enough to subdue him. So I want you to realize that there's something supernatural going on. The Bible is describing the supernatural. They had actually put this man in chains. They had put him in, in, in some metal bindings. They had tried to to, to, to restrain him. But this man with supernatural strength from the enemy, from, from, from the dark side, was breaking these things. Now, we, ha- we live a very sanitized life 
here in the developed world, and I do use air quotes on purpose, we live in the developed world where we don't see a lot of the supernatural. So what what what, what ends up happening is that the enemy of God, Satan, Lucifer, uh, um, the adversary, he in, in, in developing countries, in the third world, people see supernatural stuff a lot more than, than what we see here in the United States. Even though I do suspect that as time goes on, uh, we are going to begin to see more and more of the supernatural here in, in the United States as well, because we're too smart for the supernatural, right? So we're, we're too intelligent for this. So the enemy uses a different strategy to distract and to tempt and to seduce and to deceive the people of the developed world. You see, he knows he knows exactly what kind of bait to use uh, for every every kind of mind. You know, you, if you're too intelligent for the devil, if, if if you're too intelligent and you're too, there, there's too much reason in you, don't worry, he, the devil's got something for you too. It's called your intellect. It's called, you know, he's going to deceive you with pride. He's going to deceive you with pleasure, power, prestige, all of these things. And he will hide behind that because, you know, he's too, he's too, he's too smart for, you know, the smart people among us. But in the developed world, he uses a lot of fear, a lot of superstition. And so a lot of these supernatural things are, are, are more seen in, in the developed world. Uh, but, but we know that it's the power of the enemy versus the power of good. And so here we have something supernatural. You can't explain this. You, you can't explain how a human being is bound with metal chains, with iron chains, and he breaks them? How is that possible? It's only one way that it's possible, and, and, and is that God has allowed the enemy to have a certain amount of power. And then it says, night and day among the tombs, the, the Bible continues, and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Imagine, imagine living in, a, in, in an area where, where you walk past the cemetery and it's like creepy because not just because of the superstition, but there's a psycho living in the cemetery. And there's a dude that's like demon possessed. I remember traveling to the Philippines and in the Philippines, they have something that's very interesting uh, when you go there. And it's that every single cemetery is outside the town. They don't, they don't put the cemeteries you know, near the towns, like in the towns, they don't do that because they have a lot of superstition about spirits, the spirits of the dead. And we know that the Bible teaches that the dead know nothing. So there is no such thing as ghosts. There is no such thing as spirits floating around. We know that those are deceiving angels of, of darkness that fell from heaven. We know that, but, but there's a lot of superstition. And, and I remember that I was intrigued when I went to the Philippines and every single town had the cemetery pretty outside of the town. It wasn't next to the town. It was outside the town. And everybody had a story about how, you know, during the night when they would be walking, that they would see apparitions and whatnot. Now, imagine living in a town where there's a dude that's demon possessed and he's screaming at night. Like there's, it's creepy to think night and day, this guy would cry out and cut himself with stones, the Bible says. And then it says something really dramatic. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. Now, there's two things going on here that you need to kind of be aware of. The first one is that there is a human being that Jesus wants to deliver. There is one of his children that Jesus has come specifically to deliver in, with his power and with his glory. And there's the supernatural forces of darkness that have taken over this person's mind. And this individual, this child of God, this, this person that is desiring to be free sees Jesus, the human being, and he runs to Jesus and he falls at his knees, but he still is not in his right mind. And the Bible says that the demon begins to speak and it says the following, and he shouted at the top of his voice, the demon did, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. Now, I want you to know this is something very interesting to me. Some people today, they don't even know who Jesus is. Some people today are still wondering who Jesus is, what he is. Guess what? Satan knows who Jesus is. Satan knows exactly who and what Jesus is. And notice what it says, that the, that the man comes running. He's, his mind is still uh, controlled by the demonic forces. And the demon speaks, but the man, the demon says the following, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Satan knows who Jesus is. He's the son of the most high God. Isn't that incredible to, to, to you to read that? And then he adds, you know, the deceptive part, have you come to torture me as if Jesus is going to torture anyone 
at all. And, and, and the reason why the demon said this is because the Bible says, verse 8, for Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. It's a spirit that's not pure. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, the demon replied, for we are many. And so here the Bible shows us that it's not just one demon that had kind of taken possession of this man's mind and, and his body, but it was Legion. Now that, that word is, is the number for a thousand. Can you imagine a thousand demons controlling this man's mind? This, this man was taken over by this by this, the forces of darkness. And, and, and Jesus came to set people free from the forces of darkness. Jesus has come to set us free so that we have life and life abundantly. There is no need for any one of God's children to be oppressed by the forces of darkness. And Jesus commanded this impure spirit to leave uh, this man alone. Very dramatic story. And then the Bible says that the demons begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. And a large herd of pigs was feeding on a, a, a hill nearby. And the Bible says that the demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. That's a strange request. But Jesus gave them permission and the impure spirits came out, went into the pigs and the herd about two thousand in number rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. I want you to know that there's nothing more that the devil wants than the destruction of all God's creation. If, if you are having a bad day, if you're having a hard time and you're wondering, man, the devil's after me, the devil's trying to harass me, the devil's trying to make my life difficult, let me, let me just be absolutely crystal clear with you. The devil has no desire to harass you. He's got no desire to make your life difficult. The devil's goal is to destroy you. Uh, Satan doesn't want to bother you. Satan doesn't want to hide your keys from you. Satan doesn't want you to, you know, to, to, to mess with you and your family. Satan's goal is to destroy, to kill you. Imagine the worst serial killer that's ever lived. Imagine all these people that live among us as sociopaths that, that do the unthinkable, that they murder and they do all these crazy things. Those people have nothing on the forces of darkness. The forces of darkness don't exist in, in, in our society right now to, to bother us, to make us have bad days. Their desire and their aim is exclusively to destroy. And so when Jesus gives them permission to go into the pigs, what's the first thing that they do? They destroy and they take this herd of pigs, 2,000, and they rush down, in, down the embankment and they are drowned. And so sure enough, there's consequences. And the Bible says that those that were taking care of the pigs, they ran off, they reported in the town what had gone on in the countryside, and people went out to see what had happened. Now, notice something dramatic happens. When they came and they saw Jesus, and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed in his right mind, they were afraid. How ironic. This is unbelievable to me. They're looking at the, the man who has terrorized the neighborhood. They're looking at the guy who has, has basically been the, the guy who has haunted the cemetery. And when they see him dressed, they see him in his right mind and they see Jesus and they hear what had happened, they are afraid. How in the world can you be afraid when Jesus has just set somebody free? But the Bible says exactly why. Those who had seen it told it to the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told them about the pigs as well. And then something happens that I can't even believe it. But it says this, then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. What? How can you come face to face with Jesus and plead for Jesus to leave. Is that, does that just like blow your mind? Here's Jesus, please leave. Why would anyone ask Jesus to leave? Let me make it simple for you if I can, if I, if I can make this as simple as possible. There is always a cost to following Jesus. And the people that are surrounding this scene right now, they see the man, they see that he's been delivered, they see that he has been set free, but they also see that their economic progress has been hindered. They 
are torn because they see that Jesus has done something that none of them have been able to do. And yet they just lost. I don't even know how many hundreds, how many thousands of dollars because these pigs, obviously that was their business, have drowned themselves in the, in the ocean. There's always a cost to following Jesus. Are, are you willing to pay the cost? Are you willing to endure the test for the testimony? Don't forget that. Don't forget the fact that, that, that without a test, there's no testimony. And, and notice verse 18. This is so crazy. As Jesus was getting into the boat, did you get that? Jesus shows up, he delivers this demon-possessed man. The story goes out. Now, between the story and the and the and the Pete Towns people coming, the disciples must have had some like extra clothes because they, the, the Bible says the man was fully clothed. So maybe the disciples had like some extra, extra, you know, tunics to clothe this man. What a, what a beautiful example of, of, of serving humanity, clothing the naked, feeding the poor, helping the homeless, helping those who are underprivileged and underserved. And they did this. Jesus is into that. Serving people. Between then and the people coming, they say, please leave. And the Bible says that Jesus doesn't fight him. As he starts to get into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Isn't that amazing? Two things here. First, Jesus is a perfect gentleman. Do you realize that Jesus is not going to be anywhere where he's not wanted? Do you realize that Jesus will never force himself on us? The Bible says in Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and what? And I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, then I will go in and eat with them and they with me. Do you realize Jesus is not into forcing himself into anything? He is the perfect gentleman. I'm not wanted here. No problem. He turns to get back in the boat. Who in their right mind sees Jesus and is terrified and asks him to leave? But this man, the one who has endured the test and now has a testimony, he begins to beg Jesus, please, please don't leave me here. Please don't leave me here. I want to go with you. I want to be with you guys. And Jesus says to him, he says, nah, man, Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your own people. And tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Lord, have mercy on us. Can you imagine wanting to go with Jesus and Jesus says no? Can can you imagine this? Can you imagine you wanting to be with Jesus and you have an idea of what should happen next? And and you have come to faith in Christ. You've seen the power of Christ. You've seen the deliverance of Christ in your life. You've seen miracles happen in your life. And you're like, let's roll, Jesus, let's roll. And and, and I'm ready, please, I'm ready to go with you. And Jesus says, no, that's not what I need you to do. I don't need you to come with me. I need you to stay. And I need you to go tell every one of your family, all of your people, about the mercy that God has had in your life. This is incredible. This is unbelievable truth as we, as, we, as we contemplate. And the Bible says that the man obeyed. So the man went away and he began to tell in the Decapolis. That's an area known uh, for the, um, the, the 10 cities in this area, how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. How could you not be amazed? How could you not be amazed if, if everyone knew you as the crazy dude and and, and all of a sudden now, you're not the crazy dude anymore. Now what you are is the delivered guy. And so that's, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about coming together in the name of Jesus and understanding what it is that he wants us to do. We, it, there's two responses when you encounter Christ. There's two responses. You either want him to leave or you want to serve him. When, when, when Jesus comes into your life and he messes with you, he messes with your plan, he messes with the trajectory of your life, he messes with all of the small little things that we seem to control, we seem to like, you know, be in charge of, and he comes in. He doesn't come in to give you advice and kind of modify your life. He has come to take over your life. 
And there's two responses to this. We either ask him to leave or we join him on mission. And so today, as we, as we think about these two responses, the two responses that you and I really have in the face of all of this, I want you to think about. What are the values that we have here at Arise as we, as, we, as we continue to journey with Jesus into the pandemic? Whose idea was this? It was Jesus' idea. We didn't ask to be here. None of us expected to be here, but yet here we are. And as, and as we continue to journey in 2020, it's, it's, it's almost the end of August. People, it's, it's going to be a couple more months and we're going to be ending 2020. And some of you are like, good riddance, it's, it couldn't end sooner. But, but we have to ask the question, where are we as a church? Where are we as we've been forced into a Zoom existence, as we've been forced into like an online interaction type of digital interface? Where are we as a church? Are we being faithful to our values and, and the values of Arise are Jesus and his word, acceptance, innovation, service, making what? Disciple makers and reaching who? The next generation. Who's the next generation? Whatever generation you're not a part of. We want to empower. We want to be disciples of Jesus Christ. And so we want to take this opportunity to reconnect with why we exist as a church. Listen, man, we're following Jesus into this pandemic. Jesus is the one who said, follow me, come, we're going this way. And we're like, what is going on? We couldn't get, end one crisis, we're already stepping into another. But that's what the Bible says. The Bible says, Jesus says, come, follow me. We're about to go through a storm. And when we get through that storm, where you think you're gonna relax, we're about to face the devil head on. And we're going to overcome him in the name of Jesus. And we're going to face rejection. And we're going to face people having expectations that we can't meet. And we're going to have to face redirecting people saying, no, no, it's not time for that. It's time for this right now. And you're saying, are you sure we're in the right direction? And the answer is yes, we are. And the only way we're going to understand that is if we continue to be faithful to the calling of Jesus on our life, in our church, to do what? To make disciples who make disciples, who make disciples. Matthew 4, 19 is, is the disciple definition that we have here to rise. And, and I want you to know that it says, that Jesus says in Matthew 4, 19, then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I like the New King James Version um, of this because it talks about these three elements of disciple making. First of all, a disciple is someone who knows and follows Jesus. Who is Jesus to you? The devil knows who he is. The devil knows who he is. Legion knows who he is. He's the son of the living God. Who, who is Jesus? Do you know and do you follow Jesus? Do, you, do you, Excuse me. Do you really know Jesus? Jesus is the savior of the world. He's the son of God. He, he literally lived among us. He literally died on a cross and he literally came back to life. The tomb of Jesus is empty. Do you know him? Do, do, do you spend time with him? Do you trust him? Do you, do you every single day receive the gospel, the good news of Jesus into your heart? And the second thing that being a disciple is, is, is not only knowing him, but a disciple is being supernaturally transformed by Jesus. We know and follow. We're being supernaturally transformed. And lastly, what do we do? We join Jesus on mission. And you're asking, how in the world do I, do I fulfill my mission in this pandemic world? How do I do this? We are continuing to pursue the heart of God. This is now more than ever a time for us as a church to make disciple making disciples in this new context. Jesus has brought us here. We're not here by accident. We are here on purpose. There's a, there's a reason why Jesus has brought us to this. We use this discipleship wheel a lot in our discipling process here to rise. And, and this is a beautiful, beautiful metaphor for the journey that Jesus wants to te take each of us on. And, and, and the first week of this sermon series, following Jesus into the pandemic, Pastor Sammy did a great job of, of helping us understand what it is to be spiritually dead and to be born again. How? How are we born again? By hearing the gospel, the good news of Jesus. The good news that Jesus came and he died and he came to set us free, that he has paid the debt, that we had an, a debt that was too big. We couldn't pay. The separation between us and God is too vast. We can't jump across. We can't be reunited with, with God. But Jesus has come to build a bridge to reconnect us with God. He's the savior of the world. And, and when you hear that story, something supernatural happens in your life. You're born again. And you're born as an infant and you need to continue to hear the gospel 
And we know that the first step of discipleship is to is to go from death to infancy and you're born again and you're a child, you're an infant and then you move to a child. And, and, and as a child, what is it that you do? And, and Link helped us to see this last week that children, as they mature spiritually, they, they need to connect. They need to connect with God. They need to connect to their purpose and they need to connect with others in a life group. Like Link talked about the early church last week and, and the power of the Holy Spirit attending the corporate body of believers and how, how we need to stay together. And, and this week, I want you to consider that in order to move along in your spiritual journey, you have to move from being a spiritual child to a spiritual young adult. You need to do what this demon-possessed demoniac did. He, he, he wanted to follow Jesus. He wanted to stay with Jesus. And Jesus said, listen, I need you to begin to minister. I need you to develop in your spiritual journey. I'm, I'm kind of chuckling because in my mind, I'm like, man, that's a pretty quick maturation process. That's like an unbelievable spiritual maturity process. You're like spiritually dead, infant childhood, boom, ministry, bam. I'm already preaching in the Decapolis. Like, like that doesn't take a long time for people to move along in this, in this wheel, but it is Jesus's desire. Check this out. It's the desire of Jesus for us to mature. And this discipleship wheel is a beautiful metaphor for you to understand where are you right now? Are, are, are you an infant? Are you spiritually dead? Are you a child? Are you, are, are you moving into ministry? Are you, are you moving into young adulthood? Uh, Jim Putman uses this incredible uh, graphic. I love this graphic. Jim Putman good friend of mine, and, and we're, we're continuing to grow in, in, in our relationship with each other, Jim Putman, Real, Real Life Discipleship Ministries, uh, he, he has helped us to understand this. And, and this graphic shows the five stages of spiritual growth. Yes, you're dead. A, a spiritually dead person may ask the question uh, and may say, you know, I'm a good person. Why do I need God? Uh, they may say, I believe that there's many ways to heaven, but that's, you know that that's not true. But then they're born again when they hear the truth of Jesus and they realize that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except by him. Jesus is the truth. And, and when you're born again, you be, you're born as an infant and you move into childhood. And an infant may say stuff like Christians are hypocrites. If I'm a good person, uh, God is never going to send me to hell. And, and the church just wants my money. They're still a little cynical. But as they grow in grace, they become spiritual children. And then they may begin to say, I love my church because it's meeting all my needs. And I love my life group. It's great. And, and, and a spiritual child may still be thinking, you know, I'm upset if my group branches. I just want it to be about me and me, 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 me. But that's 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 just part of the stage. And, and we're hoping by, by prayer that you're going to mature into a spiritual young adult and a spiritual parent. Why? Because a young adult begins to think of one thing. They begin to think of others and not just themselves. And so I have a question as you as you as you have journeyed in your 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 faith journey with Jesus, are you in ministry right now? Are, are you involved in a life group? Are, are you are you stepping into ministry roles at the church? Are you are you are you making yourself available to participate in the media ministry, in the music ministry, and in, in, in the in the community service ministries? Are you asking, how can I be a part of what God's doing? And if you're not, I'm asking why? Why aren't you moving in the maturation process? Have you stepped back? Have you, have you been active in ministry? You were active in your life group. You were active in leading. And then all of a sudden, now you're not so much and you've stepped back. Why have you stepped back? Are, are, are you going backwards instead of forward? And if you're taking a step back, there is a solution. And each one of us needs the solution daily. And is this, you need to hear again and believe Again, what? The gospel. We cannot stop hearing the gospel. The gospel is what continues to give us strength day by day that Jesus is alive, that he's leading us, that he has a plan for my life and for your life, that, that we're not alone on this journey. And, and our relational discipleship process is very intentional. We have uh, the desire to connect our heads, our hearts, and our hands in making disciples. And if you attend a life group, it's not just about, it's not just about head knowledge. For a long time, a lot of us have just studied theology and, and, and we do, oh my goodness, we'll, we'll do like this unbelievable mental massaging. Just, you know, tell me more about these beautiful truths of the Bible, but, but you never told anybody. 
but you've never shared the love of Jesus because it's all up in the head. Because why? Because it needs to move to the heart. Your heart needs to be transformed. Supernaturally, your heart needs to be changed. And it's our desire for Jesus to do this in relationship. By the way, this graphic is from The Verge Network. I want to give them credit because they've come up with some phenomenal graphics that I wanted to share with you. The Verge Network has also shared with us this graphic. And it's this, that we do not go to church, but we are sent by the power of the Holy Spirit to do what? To be the church. What a powerful concept. We don't go to church. If there's anything that God has done during this pandemic, during this crisis, is to break us out of the mold that somehow church is the building. What are we to do now that we don't have the building? What about the building and the building? And Jesus is telling us, listen, we don't go to church. We are sent by the power of the Holy Spirit to do what? To be the church. What a powerful powerful truth that is. And so I want to invite you in the name of Jesus. I want you to think about where you are on the discipleship wheel. We, we, as, as Arise Miami, we have a very, very specific, powerful value system that we have embraced. And one of those values is to make disciple making disciples. We want you to be a disciple. We want you to know and follow Jesus. We want you to begin and continue to be supernaturally transformed by Jesus. And we want to invite you with all the love in our hearts to join Jesus on mission. We want to share the love. It's dangerous. It seems dangerous anyway. <laughs> the, wo- the wind and the waves, they seem like they're going to drown us. Oh my goodness, what happened? Oh, Jesus calmed that storm. Oh, I guess I get to relax now. Now, now I get to relax. I, I could take a break. No. Boom, get on the shore. Demon dude, watch the devil, head on. Crazy psychopath from the tombs. Listen, God is fully in control and he is never not on mission. And so somebody shared with me this calendar on 2020. We, we, I think they s- sent this out you know, at, in December 31st, 2019, but we didn't see it. And if you haven't seen this calendar, January, there was fires in Australia. February, there's locusts in Africa. March, COVID-19 pandemic all the way to May, June, Protests and riots. July, apparently, we had some solar flares. August, Yellowstone might erupt. September, we're supposed to have an alien invasion. And not to worry, in October, November, the pandemic is going to uh, increase again. And by December, there should be an asteroid. So I saw this calendar. I was like, man, this is 2020 to the T. And you're like, man, but this is so dramatic. What do I do? What we do is we keep following Jesus because he's at the head of our life. And you're like, but ministry, I don't have time for ministry. Listen, do you not have time to spiritually mature? Of course you do. Look what it says here. The strongest people make time to help others, even if they are struggling with their own problems. The strongest people make time to help others, even if they are struggling with their own problems. You may have heard that before. I saw this, but I was like, "Ah, I like that. Sounds a little inspirational. I just want to modify it a little bit. This is what I think. I think the strongest people are strong because they help others. I don't think that people are strong because they're strong and they're so strong that they have time to help others because they're so strong. No, no, no. The secret is that the people who are strongest are strongest because they have realized that it's not just about them. They have realized that the gospel is true, that the power of God is true, and that it's not just about them. This is the most powerful thing that you can do to move from being a spiritual child and move into spiritual young adulthood, to move from just being a consumer to being a minister for Jesus, to begin to be active at a rise, to begin to be active in Miami, serving others. And I'll leave you with this powerful quote that I love in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 to 21. Why? Now to him who is able to do what? immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever and ever. Amen. I love that scripture. Why? Because Jesus is able to do immeasurably more. Jesus wants to do immeasurably more. He wants to do so much you can't measure it. His power is limitless. And he is inviting us to grow in spiritual maturity. How? In the context of this pandemic. We're following Jesus into the pandemic. He has not asked us to stop our mission. Our mission is to follow and obey and to receive supernatural things. Why? Because it's in the test that you're going to get your testimony. Don't ask for release from the test. Ask for Jesus to help you endure the test because the testimony of what Jesus has done in your life is going to be that much greater. Who 
who's with me. Do you want to join me in following Jesus into the pandemic? I pray that you do. Heavenly Father, I pray that t- today as we hear this message, as we see the scriptures come alive, as we connect the dots in our own time and place here on earth for this time, we surrender to your sovereignty and to your will. And I ask that you bless every single person who is listening to this message, who is watching this message. We want to follow you, be transformed by you. Use us, Lord. Use us to bring comfort and encouragement to those around us. Use arise. Use us even as we're unworthy. And we will give you all the honor and all the glory in Jesus' name. Welcome to Rise Miami. It's another beautiful day to praise God because He is risen. If you believe that today, lift up your hands. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. And my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free Washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you It's your endless life Pouring down on us You have made us new Now life begins with you Released from my chains I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom He faithfully bore He canceled my debt And he called me his friend when death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me You have made me new, now life begins with you It's your relentless love Pouring down on us You have made us new Now life begins with you Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now life. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Oh, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free. Forever, amen When death was arrested And my life began Oh, we're free Free, forever We're free Come join the song Of all the redeemed 
yes, we're free, free forever, amen. When death was arrested and my life began, when death was arrested and my life began, when death was arrested and my life began.